So today we're on the roof of the physics building at the University of Nottingham in a rare moment of English sunshine uh, to talk about some of the light that comes from the sun. So this is one of our two teaching telescopes that we have here at the University of Nottingham. Uh, but this is a special one. This is a solar telescope. So it's designed to look at the sun, not your usual telescope where you take it out at night. It's actually a daytime telescope. All right, you can take me in? Yeah, come on in. Well, everyone knows that you never look at the sun with your naked eye, and you especially never ever look at the sun through binoculars or a telescope. The one exception being this kind of telescope, which is a solar telescope. This telescope allows only a certain wavelength of light from the sun through, and this is the wavelength of light I want to talk about today. This is hydrogen alpha, what we call H-alpha in astronomy, and this is a very specific wavelength of light it's 656.28 nanometers. And it marks the transition of electrons around the hydrogen atom from the third level to the second level. So if you think of the atom as this classic of Bohr atom where you've got a nucleus and you've got electrons orbiting at fixed energy levels around that nucleus, transitions from electron falling from the third level to the second level, when they do that, they release an amount of energy and that energy radiates at that specific wavelength, and we call that hydrogen alpha. It's the first level in the Balmer series, which is all of these different transitions that come down to that n equals 2 energy level. Well, if we're thinking about the sun in particular, if we look at the sun using uh, an H-alpha enabled telescope, it allows us to peer into what's called the chromosphere, literally the color sphere of the sun, which is one of the levels of the atmosphere of the sun. By narrowing down the light that you allow through your telescope till just this one interesting transition is seen, that's where you get the beautiful detailed pictures of the sun with the surface features, the sunspots, the big prominences and filaments. And you wouldn't normally see that because the detail is just washed out. I'll give you an example. So in astronomy, we often put filters in our telescope something like this that will restrict the wavelength range of the light that's allowed in. This is a very crude filter. It's really only allowing sort of reddish light in. But we want even more specific light to come through. We want not just a, way, a range of, say, 100 nanometers to come through. We want, say, only one nanometer uh, around that specific wavelength to get down to our telescope so that we can see that detail. As it's set up now, we can't look through this telescope because it's got a camera on the end of it. Unfortunately, when we turned it on today, that camera wasn't working. <sighs> it is possible to fit an eyepiece to it, and you can look through it. And the only reason, again, for safety's sake, that you can look through it is because it's got really heavy-duty um, filters in it. This is a blocking filter that reduces the amount of light and the wavelength of light. Otherwise, you would, you would fry your optics and you would fry your eye if you looked through a, an eyepiece at it. This camera over here is connected to this computer that does all the image acquisition. So this isn't a live picture? This is not unfortunately a live picture because the camera's not working today, but this is a picture that's been taken previously with this telescope. What you can see is the chromosphere of the sun and you can see some of the details, some of these light filamentary features, these dark sunspots and this beautiful big uh, loopy prominence as well as some more uh, fuzz around the, around the side. All I can see is a smiley face, a smile <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, it's like the sun's smiling at me. It is like the sun's smiling at you. Mm. But the sun is just one star, and I'm not a solar astronomer. When I deal with stars, they're in units of hundreds of billions, and they're wrapped up in packages called galaxies. So here at Nottingham, along with some colleagues of mine, we have used another telescope, a much bigger telescope, a 10-meter diameter telescope on the island of La Palma, called the Gran Telescopio Canarias, or Gran Can. We were awarded 90 hours on the telescope, spread out over a period of a few years, to do a very large project with an instrument on the telescope that works in a way not unlike the filter on this telescope works. So this is not entirely a, a correct analogy, because the telescope is different. This is a refracting telescope. It has a lens and not a mirror. But it has a very special thing inside here, which is called a Fabry-Perot etalon. It's an interference filter, and its job is to vastly restrict the amount of light coming in to isolate exactly the wavelengths that we want. So it turns our wide filter 
into a filter with a width of just a nanometer or so. And it's tunable, so it's got two little plates inside, a reflecting material, and the light comes in, bounces off those plates back and forth, and forms interferences. So uh, constructive interference where the wavelengths match, the phase of the wavelength of light matches and builds up the amplitude, and destructive interference where it cancels out. And that allows only specific wavelengths of light to get through this system. The blocking filter takes care of the rest, and out the other end comes only our wavelength of interest, H-alpha. H-alpha in extragalactic or galactic terms tells us where stars are forming in the galaxies. And that's one of the really fundamental characteristics that we're really interested in, in understanding how galaxies form and how they evolve. So if you think of something like the Orion Nebula, the big star forming region in the belt, near the belt of Orion, that's an emission nebula. So that's lots of gas and inside that stars are forming. And the stars that form are really hot, really young stars. They're radiating lots of UV light, ultraviolet light. They're ionizing all of this gas around it. So they're stripping the electrons from their hydrogen atom. And then when those electrons fall back down, they rain out radiation, including this really important hydrogen alpha. So hydrogen alpha, when we look at a galaxy, is a marker for where stars are forming. And we measure that in terms of solar masses per year. We, we measure a star formation rate of a galaxy. And some galaxies are forming stars at a much more vigorous rate than others. And part of our job is to figure out why that is. Why that? Why not just the light from the stars themselves? Well, we do that as well. That's another... So we, we, we try to approach this problem from as many angles as we can. And directly measuring the ultraviolet light from young stars is one direct measure of the star formation rate. And we do that using ultraviolet telescopes. But to be very effective, we have to get above the Earth's atmosphere to do that because thankfully the atmosphere shields most of that UV radiation uh, from, from getting down to us. Uh, so that's one tool in our toolbox. H-alpha is very handy. It's in the visible regime, which is, you know, where our optical telescopes, you know, our flagship telescopes are built to operate. Uh, and it gives us another direct measurement. It's not the whole story because some of that star formation can be hidden. It can be enshrouded in, by dust. And in that case, the UV photons don't make it out. They, get, they heat up the dust, but we can still see that because you can't hide that radiation. It just comes out re-radiated at longer wavelengths, say in the submillimeter. And you need another different kind of telescope to look, look at that. But you put all these measurements together and you get a complete census of the star formation in a galaxy. And then when we put them all together, we get this cube that lets us do some really interesting things. Because it not only gives us a picture of a galaxy, but it gives us... <laughs> Do I go down the hole? If only I can get it. Oh. Go to the middle of that stack, and you find where the peak of that spectrum is. That's what that galaxy looks like in H-alpha.